everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of the Rob Harkavy interviews exclusively on Outnews Global. Now, my next guest is somebody I have long admired from afar, but not in a creepy way, honestly. <laughs> she's, she's one of the most in demand and hardest working drag queens on the circuit with a bone structure to drive Michelle Pfeiffer into a murderous rage and the most kissable lips in Britain today, I've heard. <laughs> she's she's up. I try to get through this introduction. Come on, let's do this. She's on stage. She's on stage with her new show, Crystal Balls, at the Two Brewers from tomorrow night. So let's give a humongous outuse global welcome to the legend, the legend that is Topsy Redfern. Hello, Topsy. I, oh my god, that's like the most amazing introduction I've ever got. And yeah, I just well, love to hear more about these kissable lips, darling. Absolutely. I don't think everyone else got this memo. Let's talk later. Um, yeah, I mean, it's all downhill from here, but I'm glad you liked the intro at least. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. And um, I've, I've really been looking forward to this. Um, so with startling unoriginality, how was lockdown for you? Oh, lockdown, it was, it was really, it was really tough. I'm not going to lie. Um, just before lockdown, I was doing um, one of my dream jobs. Um, I was in a house music opera at the Young Vic. So I was living my best life, about to open a West End show. And then bloody COVID came and put a, a stop to it all. So uh, I went home to Yorkshire for a while and sat on the sofa and did nothing apart from watch Netflix for about six weeks. And then I had to give myself a bit of a talking to. Um, I ended up having to get a real job. Can you imagine how oh, awful? Sake. People and like us don't have, have real jobs. <laughs> no, people have to work eight hours a day. Can you believe it? It's awful. It's and I, I was a bit worried, actually, because I thought, what am I going to do? I've got no transferable skills. I'm a drag <laughs> queen. You know, I'm basically, I work maybe an hour or two a night. Uh, I get drunk while I'm at work. So basically, I thought, what, what am I going to do? I'm a lazy drunk. No one's going to hire me. And then, <laughs> and then I thought about... Um, some of the customers that I entertain at places like the Two Brewers. And I thought, you know what? They're lazy drunks and they hold down real jobs. If they can do it, I can do it too. Yeah. So uh, I went and got a job. I got a job in the NHS. Fantastic. What, what, yeah. what, 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 what was it? Obstetrics and gynaecology? Or... <laughs> well, I was hoping to meet myself a nice gynaecologist. My mum always told me that you don't need a boyfriend as long as you've got a thorough gynecologist. So uh, <laughs> there was a motive there. No, but um, I was working for NHS 111, actually. Wow. Um, they, they put me on the phones at the beginning, but then um, <laughs> um, I kept getting these heavy breathers on the line and I kept hanging up because I thought it was perverts, but it turned out to be people having a heart attack. They put me into admin, admin. So I was doing admin for NHS 111. Wow. Uh, but I tell you what, it has made me appreciate not only how hard everyone in the NHS works, but also uh, how much I love my job as a performer. And uh, I'm never going to moan about being a performer ever again. So talking of your job as a performer, how did you originally get into drag? Um, you know, so I, I know some, some drag queens I've interviewed sort of dressed up in their mum's and their sister's clothes and it was a natural progression or were you perhaps inspired by a previous generation of uh, drag queens on telly? Tell us. Well, there was always an element of uh, fascination with my mum was a cabaret artist. She's incredibly beautiful and glamorous. And I always used to be fascinated with the way that um, she would be able to put her makeup on and turn into this dazzling creature. Uh, so that was always something I really admired. I've got a twin sister as well. So I was surrounded by uh, females and, uh, and makeup when I was growing up. Um, but then, you know, as I was growing up, you know, you get that thing growing up in the 80s etc all that kind of girliness was something that I was kind of slightly taught to be a bit ashamed of and mm -hmm. to hide as I got a bit older uh, so I went to drama school and uh, did all that kind of thing where, where, where any opportunity to do fancy dress or dress up I would I would make sure that I, I got my drag out mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until I, I, I finished drama school and I started auditioning and people just kept casting me as 
drag roles or cross-dressing roles or ladies. Uh, my mum says it's because I've got a pretty face. Maybe it's something to do with my lips, darling, as you were saying earlier. I don't know. I, don't know. But <laughs> I, I kept getting uh, cast as women. Um, and then I was in, in, in a musical, Chicago in the West End, playing uh, Mary Sunshine. And I started hanging out with Madame Jojo's. Yeah, and that yeah. was my first real taste of drag. And then I moved in with um, a drag queen called Lady LaRue. I don't know if you remember Lady LaRue yeah, yeah. from the UK. Uh, unfortunately she's not with us now she's in drag heaven but she was kind of my drag mother and she was like topsy oh and nathan as i was then she was like you need you need to get yourself doing some drag you'd be really good at it and i was like oh no how tacky and down market i'm a theater actor i don't want to be doing that <laughs> and now look at me darling yeah i do it six nights a week i love yeah. it now um you are part of a what i think is a brilliant initiative called drag queen story time which, which has not been without its controversy um mm. but we'll set the controversy aside because it's meathead who's obviously never seen a pantomime um can Absolutely. You, yeah. Uh, can you tell us about Drag Queen Storytime? Um, well, I kind of heard about it and I knew that I wanted to be involved because um, uh, talking back to being in the 80s as well and growing up, I just remember that there was never really any stories about me, about people that look like me. Um, there was never any um, thing on the television. And I think, you know, you just end up growing up feeling like you're a bit different and a bit weird and an outsider and even though I've got a lovely family and I feel very loved like I don't know I just don't think it's fair that people have to grow up feeling a sense of shame about who they are yeah, yeah. and you know and that's deeply connected with the stories that we tell when we're children the stories that we get told so um I really wanted to be involved in drag queen story time just because it means there's a chance to tell the right stories, stories where we're included, where we can yeah. see ourselves, where we don't feel like we're weirdos, you know, because, you know, every kid, every young kid, no matter who they are, deserves to feel uh, like they're important and they have value and not grow up with a sense of shame. And so that's really the main reason why I've done it. And it's just uh, really heartwarming to see the number of families um, who who haven't got queer kids, but they just you know they just want to bring their children to come along and um, uh, bring them up to be open minded, interested in the world, to be tolerant, uh, to be respectful, and to like celebrate all the different diversity that is around us. You yeah. know. I mean, I, it, it's, I it's think the controversy that gets the publicity inevitably, but generally from teachers and parents, <laughs> what's the reaction been? Generally, the reaction is massively positive and it feels like there's a thirst and a desire for this kind of thing to happen. Um, occasionally, there are individuals who you feel, for whatever reason, maybe prejudice, maybe religious beliefs, find it um, distasteful, I can tell, or, or whatever. But, you know, and there is still a deep-rooted fear that um, by doing something like Drag Queen Storytime, we allow... Uh, or, or, or can convert children yeah. into being queer and there's a danger of that which you know as we all know is like a ludicrous idea you know all it does is teach the children who are queer to be respectful and embracing and the children who are it gives them um, a sense of belonging to something yeah. and a sense of community um, so and the irony is it's just that connection between being gay and being a drag queen and sex. And yes, we work in nightclubs where we talk about sex a lot on stage, but that's because there are safe spaces where uh, historically these are the only places we can have those discussions. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, it's like credit us performers with the ability to know your audience. I'm yeah. not going to be talking about that in front of uh, yeah. children. You mentioned a little bit earlier that you were about to... Uh, perform at the Young Vic as your well as your alter ego Nathan uh, before yeah. the pandemic. Funny enough, the the Young Vic was where I got my first paid work. I was in a play there at the age of twelve. So there wow. we are. Uh, long time, long time ago. I'm well. I will. You know, you'll work out my age from this. It was the summer of 1976. That boiling hot summer. Um, and uh, there we are. Um, oh, darling, you're looking so good for your age. 
age? What's your secret? Well, what I do is I give free advertising on Out News Global to aesthetic and cosmetic clinics in return for treatment. On stage as Nathan or on stage as Topsy, if you had to make the choice that your career could only take the one path, uh, which would you have to, uh, you had to make the choice, which would you choose? That's really, really difficult. That's really difficult. Um, I think the, a lot of my life has been uh, finding obstacles and robots because I always seem to fall between two boxes. Um, but I'm coming to a point where I kind of celebrate being a bit in the middle of everything. And that's yeah. where a lot of work comes from. So that even that job at the Young Vic, came about, I was playing a kind of gender non-binary role, if you like. Yeah, yeah. But if I had to choose, if I had to choose now, I I, I think it would be top C. I, I, I love, I love working on the cabaret circuit and I love that interaction you get with an audience. And that, you know, if, if you're uh, on stage and the audience is the other side of the proscenium arch and you don't really speak to them after the show, you don't really get a sense yeah. of what you've done, but getting to speak to people after you've performed and know that you've like facilitated a really great night with someone or they've come in and had a shit time uh, and then you you know you've cheered them up made them forget the troubles of their day like it's such a rewarding experience to know that you've like been a part of that um that it's addictive and I don't think I'd be able to live without it now yeah so you're you're on stage at the two brewers uh from tomorrow night uh with your show crystal balls and uh Viewers, just so you know, just to let a bit of light in on the mystique, if you could see Topsy below the waist, she's just wearing rehearsal sweatpants. Oh, there we are. Oh, my goodness. There you go. <laughs> you oh. Rehearsal, rehearsal uh, gear, fabulous realness today. <laughs> sequins above the waist, that's all we will cry. So, um, obviously, the name Crystal Balls is in the beautiful British camp tradition of double entendres. You know, she asked for a double entendre, so I gave her one, that sort of thing. But can you set up the show for us and uh, tell us what's it about, how it differs from your previous shows? Uh, so this, um, it kind of starts off as if it's going to be a regular drag cabaret, but then it kind of takes a, a different turn. It's definitely a piece of queer theatre. Um, rather than a loose cabaret show. <laughs> it's, um, uh, I think when you're doing drag cabaret, uh, the emphasis on frivolity, campness, fun, um, and although this show is all those things and it is very funny, uh, it also, there's room there for a bit more light and shade, uh, for something, sections which are a bit more moving, a bit more serious, a bit more thought provoking. Um, it, it all came about during lockdown really, um, uh, without nothing to do, et cetera. I kind of turned 40. Can you believe it, darling, 40? <laughs> and um, it kind of got me thinking about my roots, not, not only my grey roots, which yeah. um, I've sprayed, I sprayed with my L'Oreal root spray today, but like um, my, my roots, um, uh, family roots, because my great grandmother was a fortune teller, a gypsy fortune teller of some renown in her day. She used to tell the fortunes of famous people, uh, such as Lady Asta, um, mm -hmm. And so I really wanted to explore that legacy and uh, that traveller identity, which because of uh, my parents getting divorced, I didn't really ever get told about, have access to. So the show is kind of an exploration of that kind of traveller culture and also growing up as a gay man in the 80s. Um, and there is links to drag queen story time. So it's all about the stories we tell about who who gets to tell those stories and what, what impact that has on our lives. Um, uh, yeah, it's been going super well though. People are finding it really funny and moving. And um, uh, you know, I'm just overwhelmed by how much people are enjoying the show. So it's, it's really great. Right, so, I mean, that's terrific. I think it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if there's anyone left watching this who has actually not heard of the two brewers, uh, we'll be putting all the information on the screen, folks. So uh, go along and see Topsy. Now, as I intimated in my introduction, you are very, very hardworking. And I know you were disingenuous saying that um, you work an hour a day. I know it's much, much harder <laughs> than that. Um, what's after this uh, run ends? What's coming up next for you? Um, well, obviously, there's the regular drag cabaret gigs as well. Um, we have um, 
Are you there, darling? Oh, yes, you just I'm back a to me. Oh. The regular drag cabaret gigs. Um, hopefully, uh, Crystal Balls. Uh, we, we've had funding for the Arts Council to develop it. So we've, we've been uh, rewriting and uh, learning as we go along. So this kind of version, uh, the Brewers, uh, I think we'll get one more rewrite after we see how it all goes. And uh, I think we're going to plan on doing a tour of it in the autumn. Wow. We are going to hopefully take to Edinburgh Festival next year. Um, I'm hoping that the uh, Orpheus at the um, the uh, Young Vic will be returning at some stage. We're waiting to hear about that. And also, I'll um, I'll be doing pantomime. I think this year. I think I'm doing it at Torquay Theatre. Oh this year. yeah, ugly sister. Can you believe it, darling? No. This is this is a scurrilous miscasting. Some someone needs to refer this to the War Crimes Commission in the Hague. This is just <laughs> no good. <laughs> um, great theatre though that one in Torquay. I know it's a it's a lovely theatre. So now you've turned forty. Do you think your Cinderella days are over? Well, I don't know. I did play Snow White a couple of years ago in the Adult Pants in Brighton. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Darling, any time. I'll get my legs out any time. You know, a bit of balloon for the dads, as they say. We'd heard that. Now, <laughs> before we go, because I know you're about to kick off some rehearsals, uh, we'd like to conclude with a quick fire round for all my favourite guests. So are you up for it? OK, cool, cool, cool. I'm ready Let's to. Let's do it. First up, cheese or chocolate? Uh, chocolate. Good answer. <laughs> Netflix and chill or party till dawn? Oh, Netflix and chill. It's getting old, dear. <laughs> Beach holiday or city break? Oh, city break. Oh, look at you. Come Netflix and chill and city break. You can tell she's turned 40, folks. And... <laughs> no, darling. I listen to Radio 4 as well. What's happened to me? <laughs> Soft gardener's question time. Uh, soft and sensual or down and dirty? Oh, soft and sensual. I just want someone to look me in the eye and pretend they love me for 20 minutes is that is that uh, it's, all, it's all anyone wants it's all all of us want topsy you know <laughs> yeah. so topsy it has been an absolute pleasure you're clever you're fun you're gorgeous the total package so it only oh. remains for me to thank you for joining us to exhort you to break a leg at the two brewers from tomorrow and of course to wish you much love luck and happiness thank you so much Thank you, darling. It's been a pleasure. I hope to do it again soon. Loads of love.